Patty Gerstenblith here at the law school. Among other things, I'm the director of the Center for Art, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law. I want to thank, uh, in addition to my own center, I want to thank the CIPLIT, the Center for Intellectual Property Law and Information Technology, and the Center for Judaic Law, excuse me, Jewish Law and Judaic Studies. Um, and their two directors, Professor Barb Bressler and Professor Bobby Paul. Unfortunately, neither of them could be here with us today, um, but I'm very appreciative for the support uh, and for helping to advertise this program. I'm particularly pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Jennifer Crater from Northern Kentucky uh, University Salmon P. Chase College of Law. Uh, Professor Crater has been a longtime friend of mine, and I'm a great admirer of her work in the cultural property field. She is a graduate of the University, excuse me, the Georgetown University Law Center. She's published extensively about and given many presentations in domestic and foreign venues about legal issues affecting the international art market. With Norman Palmer, she is co-authoring the second edition of Museums and the Holocaust, published by the Institute of Art and Law in London. Professor Crater often engages in pro bono and volunteer work. She's participated in meetings at the United States Department of State, hosted by the Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues, and she was involved in a diplomatic conference on Holocaust-era assets held in Prague and in Theresienstadt in June of 2009. Um, Professor Crater, over the last couple of years, has also co-authored motions and amicus briefs, um, probably beyond counting as far as I can tell concerning conflicts of law and Holocaust history in critical Nazi looted art cases. Um, she has worked with the American Jewish Congress and the Commission for Art Recovery in doing this. She currently serves as the co-chair of the American Society of International Law's Interest Group on Cultural Heritage and the Arts. She previously served as co-chair of the ABA's uh, Art and Cultural Heritage Committee in its section on international law. And she's also been active with the Lawyers Committee for Cultural Heritage Preservation, including, among other things, for those of you who were here on the last 10 days, serving as a brief grader for uh, our own moot court competition in the cultural heritage law field. So it is, as I said, a great pleasure for me to welcome Professor Crater here to DePaul. And I'm very excited and look forward to hearing her presentation. Thanks to everyone for coming today to hear about this. And um, special thanks to Professor Gerson Blith for inviting me today to Paul Law School for hosting me today. And special thanks also to the Center for Art, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law, the Center for Intellectual Property Law and Information Technology, and the Center for Jewish Law and Judaic Studies, and also to Vadim uh, Schifrin for helping with logistics today. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, something that, that may not sit well with a lot of you. Um, the topic of my talk, as you can see here, is how some US museums are using our courts to distort history. And I should start off by saying that I love museums. Um, I absolutely love museums. I, 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 um, when I go and I give these talks, I bring my, my husband and my son with me everywhere we go. And we, bring, we drag our son through as many museums as we possibly can. Um, so, and I've done work for museums. So this is not a bash museums lecture. Um, but I also um, am quite concerned about what some museums in the United States have done and what the impact of that will be um, both upon the historical record as well as upon the ability of the US government to exercise leadership so that we can restitute Holocaust era art from public collections and private collections and museums um, in this country as well as in others. Now, um, another thing I would like to say is that at its heart, this is about people. I think that too often the conversation um, loses that fact that um, at, at its heart, this is about victims and this is about restoring property that was stolen from victims. And the restoration of that property is in full accordance with US policy going all the way back to the war. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk to you about. Um, as soon as the Nazis came to power, there were crippling sporadic boycotts uh, throughout Germany. 
And the impression that is being left in some of these cases that are being litigated is that up until a certain point in the, in the Nazis' um, uh, regime, that Jews were free to enter into arm's length transaction and it was business as usual. So that any sales of art that happened before some particular date must, must have been voluntary. And, must have, and so that these litigations, uh, these, these cases, are simply buyer's regret. And that is just not the case. And that's one of the myths that I like to dispel today. Um, for those of you who aren't completely um, uh, aware of, of what the Nazis did specifically in, in regards to art, the Nazis did target degenerate art, modern art which they viewed as being um, a, a, an infection of German culture. Of course, the Germans uh, targeted Jews in order to eliminate them from the, from the Reich um, because of their religious reasons. Um, they also targeted culture, and they wanted to eliminate German culture from the Reich other than what they preserved in a museum. And the Nazis targeted this degenerate art, and they created a show that toured around, and it showed the German people this is the bad art, and then on the other side of the show, this is the good art, and this is what is acceptable and what we should esteem to. And Jewish, art, and Jewish artists were blacklisted. It was, it was a crime to be a Jew, of course, in Germany, and the, it, was, it was no less true for artists. Now, another myth that I think is circulating is that most of the paintings that were stolen, um, other than maybe some, a few that we can find in some collections, <coughs> were destroyed during the war, either in, bo in bomb bombing raids or um, the Germans themselves destroyed them because they sought to destroy degenerate art. Well, it's estimated that the Germans destroyed maybe 10 to 15,000 um, uh, modern art pieces. That leaves an awful lot of modern art that was sold. And we know for a fact that there was a very lively market for uh, modern art and other art um, from 1933 all the way through the end of the war. And a lot of the art was being funneled out through Switzerland. And so the, mar the market wasn't just um, Hitler and his cronies. The market, the market outside of the Reich was eating up these paintings. Um, I've seen documentation and leaflets and advertisements for auctions that were held in Switzerland by the Nazis in order to raise foreign currency. And I've seen evidence that some names that everybody in America would recognize went to those auctions and bought some of those paintings. And there are more names that people who are insiders in the art world would recognize did the same or had other people do the same. And then we had those paintings purchased here in the United States. Some of those paintings, some, were purchased directly by some museums. Far more were purchased by collectors who then later made donations of those paintings to museums. And that's the heart of the infection that um, we are now uh, dealing with in our institutions. Now, most, most people in the museum community and in, in the uh, art world insider community want to do the right thing about this. But there are plenty of people who are content. And there's even been an article in the New York Times, and there's been an article in German publications about people being content, even um, wanting to just let the art stay where it is. Why should we disrupt this now? Now, I was at a lecture recently um, uh, over in Italy. And Howard Spiegler, who's, who I know has spoken here before, um, and he's a plaintiff's lawyer who um, has recovered quite a lot of art very successfully. And he mentioned a quote that I had, I had read before in years past, but it was when he said it as a plaintiff's lawyer. And I am, I am a lawyer, but I have never represented a party in any Nazi-era art case. I've appeared on behalf of, of Amici, Friends of the Court. Um, I've done some free pro bono consulting. But I come at this as an academic. So, what I say, I think, to a lot of people's ears doesn't sound objective, but I'm the one who's objective. I'm the one in academia who doesn't have a dog in the fight. And when he said this quote, and he's been advocating um, on behalf of 
claimants for so long, it really hit home for me. And he relayed a testimonial by Rabbi Israel Singer, who was the leader of the World Jewish Congress. And he said, Himmler said, you have to kill all the Jews because if you don't kill them, their grandchildren will ask for their property back. And when he said that, it was finally, after, I mean, I had read it years before, but after seeing the criticism of heirs who had recovered art and then auctioned it, I mean, how else, how else do you deal with a painting with multiple heirs, for, for example, um, for one instance? But the criticism of the heirs for what they've done with their own property once they've recovered it after we, the public, have benefited from being able to enjoy it for all of these years, um, it, that quote really drove home to me what this is all about. If we don't restitute this art, we play right into the hands of what the Nazis were doing and what their intentions were and what the profiteers intended. And that is just fundamentally wrong. And the law doesn't suit these claims well. And I'm going to talk more about that. And everybody in the legal community has recognized that the law doesn't suit these claims well. And that's why in 1998, we had a, a conference in Washington, D.C. that resulted in the Washington Principles, which are soft law guidelines for what countries should do in order to try to restitute art. And you have to remember that throughout the rest of the world, most museums are governmentally owned. We're the exception, with most of our museums being privately owned. So when governments signed on to the Washington Principles, which I'm going to show you in a moment, um, most of those countries are effectively in control of the collections, whereas that's not the case here. Right? We have the Smithsonian, we have some governmentally run uh, museums, but that's not the norm here. So I'll show you one more slide about the lines of people lining up to see the bad art, the scandalous art, um, maybe for the last time in their minds, but also then alongside um, the good art. And then I'll show you a picture. The Nazis took everything. This is just one picture from inside of a salt mine, and these are bags of gold. The Nazis took absolutely everything. They took gold. They took insurance policies. They took bank accounts. They took real property. They took all the, all the contents of the real property. And what was happening is um, so, uh, uh, Jews within the Reich were required to fill out inventories after a certain date. And the, the Nazis intended to take everything, and they did in the most evil, systematic way. They forced the Jews to, in, to create inventories of their own property so that the Nazis wouldn't miss anything. They took absolutely everything. And after the war, after our, our military and the Allied forces' attention turned from restitution, which was occurring, you, we, a lot of you probably heard of the Monuments Men, and the Monuments men were in charge of setting up these huge collection points to try to round up everything that the Nazis had taken in terms of art um, and then restitute it back. Well, we developed, we, we decided on the Marshall Plan and we had independent nations and new democracies and we wanted to pump them up financially rather than extract huge reparations. Right? The, after World War I, the, perce the perception was that the extraction of huge reparations was one factor that contributed to the Nazis' rise to power. So once that happened, rather than our army's focus being restitution back to individuals, potentially, couldn't do that. We were concerned about Soviet, the Soviets expanding their sphere of, sphere of influence all the way to the Atlantic. So we went to a, a program of external restitution where we would return art to the countries from which it was taken as best as we could tell. And then the obligation fell onto those countries to find the families and restitute it. Well, we had a systematic failure there. And I can understand why. I mean, Europe was in rubble, the Cold War began, um, families were in complete tatters, countries were in complete tatters, people murdered, refugees wandering, civil war in some places. So I can understand why we had a failure, but it is a failure. And after the war, another thing that was signed was the London Debt Agreement. And the London Debt Agreement froze most individual claims. Let's let, let's let Germany get 
get off the ground and get, get growing again. Same, same um, for other countries as well. So in the mid-1990s, when the London Debt Agreement expired, that's when you saw in the press all this news about various class actions for slave and forced labor, for bank accounts, for unpaid insurance policies, and whatnot. Well, most of those claims were effectively dealt with via treaties during the Clinton administration. And I'm painting with a broad brush here. There are exceptions. Um, but most of them are dealt that way. But the art was never dealt with in that way. And what the international community, community could do, and the United States led this effort, is we held that conference in Washington, D.C. 44 nations signed on to these Washington principles. And I'm not going to read all of them, though. I just highlighted a few pieces. But in essence, in essence, it said that on the collection side, on the museum side is what this means, right? that work should be identified, that has gaps in the ownership history or the provenance. The records and archives should be open so that claimants can start to figure out that they have claims. People after the war couldn't even find their family members in many instances, much less their property. Archives were sealed, it was before the internet, um, and people were dispersed all over the globe. Um, a lot of times what happened was survivors passed away or died or murdered, um, and they were the only ones who actually had key information to even know what the property might be to which the family or heirs might have claims. So this also says that pre-war owners and their heirs should be encouraged to come forward and that we should reach just and fair solutions and that nations are encouraged to develop national processes to implement these principles. And what this last piece was mostly designed to achieve was sort of alternative dispute resolution tribunals. So people don't have to be forced to go into court because everybody, even at this point, recognized that the law doesn't fit these claims very well. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Now, there have been some other follow-ups from the Washington Conference, but I'm going to focus on one in 2009. And, and we had a conference in Prague, and the resulting declaration is called the Terezin Declaration. And I'm only going to highlight one piece for you, because it effectively reinforces what the Washington Principles say. But it also says that claims should be resolved expeditiously and based on the facts and merits of the claims. In other words, not based on technicalities like statutes of limitation. And these cases that I am, that I am uh, saddened by, and that I'm going to focus on in a bit, the museums have gone to court. Some, of, some museums have gone to court and filed what we call declaratory judgment actions to block the ability of claimants to claim their property on statute of limitations grounds. So when you read in the press that a museum beat a claim uh, as to a piece of Nazi looted art or Holocaust era art, chances are what you're reading about is that the museum got a court to say the statute of limitations ran on this. The, the court never said the museum has clean title. And in fact, under our common law jurisprudence, title can't be passed when there is a thief in the chain of title. A thief can't pass more than the thief has. So the museums, yes, they have blocked the ability of the people most likely with title to come and actually file a lawsuit. But they have not quieted title or cleared title in a formal sense. Now, a lot of what you hear in the press is that nobody knew about this until 1998, right? Every, you know, this was just, you know, gosh, we never asked any questions. You know, we bought art, and it would be even impolite <coughs> to have asked where it came from. We didn't know about this. This took everybody by surprise, and that's completely false. And what I'm going to do is just highlight some of the major publications centering around New York or major national publications to show that that's false. And so here's a New York Times headline, a front page, March 20th, 1933. 
German fugitives tell of atrocities at hands of Nazis. Americans bear out tales of outrages and cruelties and racial purging. Jews flee persecution. Um, I should also note here that with those, along with those boycotts in 1933, something that predated the Nazis' rise to power was the flight tax. So anybody who, who wanted to flee the Reich had to give up an extraordinary percentage of their property in order to do so. And if you couldn't make the tax, you couldn't flee. And so that is another factor that needs to be taken into consideration. If we need to take into consideration all of the facts and circumstances surrounding whether a particular transaction was voluntarily entered into, well, that's another key one that needs to be kept in mind. And too often, I think that's lost on the courts that have decided these cases. So to go forward, April 16th, 1933, again, New York Times, racial art in Germany, about the purges. Uh, New York Times, July 15th, 1933, Hitler will seize property of foes. December 24th, 1933, year of Hitler nears end with small hope for Jews. And then after the war, there also was a tension in the press. So I'll show you that, and then I'll back up and talk a little bit more about executive policy. So these, this is a series of three articles in the New Yorker. Um, this is on February 20, uh, 22, 1947. And this was written by um, I, 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 Janet Flanner. And she was a very well-regarded cultural commentator at the time. And this is Annals of Crime, The Beautiful Spoils. It's all about Nazi looting of art. March 1st and March 8th follow-up articles as well. <coughs> so this was talked about in the press after the war. This wasn't a surprise um, for the world by 1998, and not, and not Art World Insiders as well, uh, either. Now, executive policy similarly, similarly has supported restitution of Nazi looted art going all the way back to the war. On January 5th, 1943, the United States issued the London Declaration. And the London Declaration warned people who were engaging in supposedly voluntary transactions with, um, uh, with anybody in regards to Jewish property. They warned that the looting and this manner of stealing would be declared, and I'm quoting now, invalid. Okay. Well, the United States would declare invalid any transfers of or dealings with property and then I cut out some of the quote just to cut this down. Whether such transfers or dealings have taken the form of open looting or plunder or of transactions apparently legal in form even when they purport to be voluntarily affected. So we knew at this point that the Nazis were obsessed with legality. So even if they didn't engage in outright theft, we had duress and forced sales. They weren't voluntary sales. There might be a contract that papers over the transaction, but it is not a voluntary contract. And to boot, <coughs> oh, excuse me. there are plenty of known instances, and this was remarked upon by the US consul in Vienna in 1938, shortly after the Anschluss, um, there are, there are plenty of instances where the Nazis would send one spouse into a concentration camp, force that spouse to sign a power of attorney so that the spouse on the outside would have the legal authority to fill out those inventories that the Nazis used to systematically expropriate all of the Jews' property. And we are talking about the most massive expropriation the world has ever seen. We're talking about tremendous quantities of money that fueled not only the Holocaust, but also fueled the um, Nazi war effort um, against the Allies, so against us. Now, I already mentioned the Marshall Plan. I already mentioned the Monuments Men. Also after the war, Germany and Austria were, re were required um, in, in treaties. They were required to repudiate the forced and duress sales that occurred during the war in order to rejoin the Society of Nations. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about executive policy. There were lawsuits 
that started even during the war um, for, for people who were here trying to reclaim property that had been expropriated by the Nazis. And the United States um, appeared in one of those cases, famous case known as the Bernstein case, that went up to the United States um, Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And Jack B. Tate, who was acting legal advisor to, of the US Department of State, um, sent the letter over to um, the Second Circuit. And it informed the, the Second Circuit, which was acting in a restrictive way. It used what's called the act of state doctrine so that it wouldn't investigate whether Nazi expropriation was uh, legal or not. That's sort of the premise of the act of state doctrine. And the State Department, the executive branch, corrected the court and said this government has consistently opposed the forcible acts of dispossession of a discriminatory and confiscatory nature practiced by the Germans on the countries or people subject to their controls. The policy of the executive with respect to claims asserted in the United States for the restitution of identifiable property or compensation in lieu thereof, lost through force, coercion, or duress as a result of Nazi persecution in Germany, is to relieve American courts from any restraint upon the exercise of their jurisdiction to pass upon the validity of the acts of Nazi officials. So the executive branch is saying to the judicial branch, go ahead. Resolve these claims about Nazi expropriation. We are in favor of using the courts to resolve the claims in this way. And the State Department um, executive branch did more. It sent out letters to universities, museums, libraries, art dealers, and booksellers. Here's one from December 11th, 1950. Warning, be on the lookout for art. It's the responsibility and desire of this government to get the loot and restitute it to the right people. That is our executive policy. And here's one from 1945. And this is from the uh, American Commission for the Protection and Salvage of Artistic and Historic Monuments and War Errors. Um, this is uh, the, the unit that's typically referred to as a monuments men. Um, and it was sent to museums, art and antique dealers, and auction houses. Okay? It is, of course, obvious that no clear title can be passed on objects that have been looted from public or private collections abroad. So be on the lookout for loot. You can't, you can't buy and sell this. We also seized many, many paintings. Um, I'll show you one example here. Um, this is from November 16th, 1964, again from the New York Times. Europe is still hunting its plundered art. And if you read, read on in here, by this date, um, the executive branch had seized approximately 4,000 objects in the United States. So the executive branch is actively trying to cleanse our country of this stolen loot. Also, Ardelia Hall, who was a powerhouse um, of, uh, in, within the State Department um, and was really an advocate for restitution of cultural property, she wrote um, in, in a publication known as the um, State Department Bulletin. And this came out on January, on, oops, excuse me. This came out also in 1951, August 27th, 1951. For the first time in history, restitution may be expected to continue for as long as works of art are known to have been plundered during a war, continue to be rediscovered. So as long as we can still find it, we can seek restitution. That has been the consistent message from the State Department going all the way back to the war. And it's seized by 1964, approximately 4,000 paintings. I can't find any numbers to tell you what the count is any longer. But I can tell you that just a few weeks ago, it seized two more that had been stolen from the Polish National Museum. Also, you will read in the press about quiet return ceremonies and, and restitutions that the United States helped to negotiate. I suspect that in the background of that negotiation is the moral suasion of the United States and also the possibility of a seizure if the museum or collector doesn't treat uh, the situation properly. Now, I also want to tell you that going forward, so it's not that 
this was this painting, the paintings and other art objects might have been in, in corrupt hands, and then the art market fell asleep, and then everything traded hands again, and all of a sudden, you know, nobody knew anything. The story remained in the press. Here's another one from National Geographic, January 1996. And at about this time, we also saw some other landmark scholarship that helped push this back onto the national agenda. And then um, we also had some private, um, well, uh, civil litigations being filed. So not everything was done by seizure. Just as in the Bernstein case, the United States government, the executive branch, said the courts were open. Well, we had other cases. I just highlighted two here just to show you two for people seeking recovery of their property, their art that they found within the United States. And then we had um, a monumental seizure that really caused quite an uproar. Um, Portrait of Wally uh, on the left was seized along with Dead City um, in 1998 at the state level in New York and then because of a New York statute that blocks seizure of, um, of art on loan to New York institutions. The subpoena was quashed in 1999 and then the Fed stepped in and seized it um, under the National Stolen Property Act and other um, statutes uh, that relate to customs. <laughs> and this case recently settled a couple of months ago um, for $19 million. Um, so there is a lot of money involved, right? I, I, I haven't spoken about it yet, but on the, the, that is a factor. I mean, uh, th there's also an emotional factor, but this also is a factor, and I don't want to pretend that it's not. And people deserve their property back. Now, so we've had seizures of various types. Um, we've had private litigation of, of various types. And then a new trend emerged, a trend where collectors, possessors of art, would go to court and file those declaratory judgment actions. And so um, here are two of them. Um, uh, I believe Femme en Blanc might have been the first one. And then the US government stepped in and seized this painting. Um, and then this one was seized as well. And then uh, we had another case that I want to tell you about, uh, which maybe you've seen before. So this predates these two declaratory judgment actions. But Republic of Austria versus Altman went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court on a very narrow jurisdictional issue about whether Austria could be sued in the courts of the United States for conduct that predated the passage of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, and the United States uh, Supreme Court said, yes, it can. And then we had a private arbitration in Vienna with Viennese arbitrators in the German language. And Ms. Maria Altman was awarded five paintings that she had claimed, and one other went to a different family. Um, and she was actually criticized in the New York Times because she sold this painting, which is her painting, after it was restituted. Wouldn't it be better on the walls of a museum where we can all enjoy it? And I think, wouldn't it be better if, if all of us would, would command that our public institutions not stand on top of the shoulders of Nazis and profiteers? Wouldn't it be a stronger statement that we will not accept the benefits of genocide and enjoy them as public goods? Now, the disturbing trend in the courts has been that since this big win, which didn't even resolve the entire case, but since this big win in 2004, only one Holocaust claim has won in court. And that's this one. And the facts were so egregious. Now, I know that doesn't tell the whole story. Right? Plenty of claims have settled, um, and plenty have settled even before anybody went to court, which is the way it should be. That's when the system is working. But now let me tell you about a few of the cases that really disturb you. The Detroit Institute of Arts um, and the Toledo Museum of Art filed declaratory judgment um, actions against um, uh, 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 the heir, uh, heirs of a Holocaust victim. And so they went right along with that trend. Let's go to court and block the claim on statute of limitations grounds. And in both of these instances, I, I think that it's, it's, it's really uh, tragic the way the courts decided the statute of limitations issue. In the Detroit case, the court ruled that um, the, the woman who lost possession, the Holocaust victim, she lost possession in 1938, and there was a paper transaction, and there were dealers involved with whom she had done business in the past. And the Detroit court 
held that the statute of limitations ran in 1941. Now, very similar situations surrounding this painting, uh, vir are virtually the same facts, and the Toledo court didn't rule exactly on which date the statute of limitations ran, but it ran a long time ago, that's for sure. Um, and it said this claim is clearly barred. Um, and then it also said something very problematic, that, and because the family would have been aware of what was happening in the 90s, Congress hold, held hearings, there's lots of press, right? that they should have been on notice at that point, at the latest, start looking for their, their, their property. So it's the Jews, the victims, who are at fault for waiting too long to seek to recover their own property. And for that reason, the statute of limitations ran. Our law, in addition to the uh, you can't get title from a thief doctrine, also follows the discovery rule. And I know I'm in a law school, so many of you probably have heard of that before, but the, the statute of limitations doesn't start to tick until you know where your property is and who, you, who should be sued in order to recover it. And in a lot of those cases, if you read it, there's also an inherent in there that you have a valid forum where you can actually go and assert that claim. Now, after the war, post-war restitution, I already told you about everything being in a shambles and how difficult it was, but post-war restitution in a lot of instances was also infected. Um, it was infected by anti-Semitism um, to a large degree and also greed. So one scandal that broke in the late 1990s, for example, and this is the one that Ms. Maria Altman's family had been caught in, was that Austria required donations of certain paintings in order to get export permits for the rest of your property. So you can either come back to Austria where your family was persecuted and enjoy your property, or you can donate this to us and take out the rest. And you can take that to wherever you live. Um, another thing I would like to point out about this painting in particular is um, uh, the Holocaust victim lost possession of it in 1938, and the Toledo Museum of Art snatched it up in 1939. So this is not a situation where people had no idea what the history was um, and, and were completely taken aback. Anybody who would have thought for two seconds where this art was likely or possibly coming from should have been asking questions, at a minimum. Also, after the war, there was, this, there was um, Military Government Law 59 was put into place, which set forth a presumption that transactions entered into where property changed hands from a Jew to a non-Jew, that, that the presumption would be that it was subject to duress and a forced sale. So we have laws like that in place Yet, our courts are being manipulated on statute of limitations grounds such that the heirs never get the benefit of any of those assumptions. And that's exactly why the Washington Principles and the Terezin Declaration were signed. Because we recognize that today, there's going to be some difficulty to paint the full picture for what the full context is in which these contracts should be viewed. One, one of the plaintiff's lawyers described to me how frustrated he was because he felt like every time he went to court, he had to convince the court that the Holocaust happened. Um, Museum of Modern Art and the Solomon, uh, Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation versus Schupps similarly filed a declaratory judgment action. This one was about to go to trial and settled on the courthouse steps. So again, I'm very alarmed by museums going to court in complete contravention to their own ethics guidelines as well as in contravention to the Washington Principles and the Terezin Declaration to stamp out these claims before they can be heard. We're distorting history and we're hiding the history. And I'm going to skip this. Um, one thing I do want to highlight from this, and this is from the museum's complaint at paragraph 55. Instead of relying on facts, they're relying on uh, stereotypes of how people would have behaved. The allegation that the Nazi government would force von Mendelssohn Bartholdi and his wife, um, the two um, victims in this case, to sell their paintings to the Jewish art dealer Tannhauser, whose name has popped up in a number of these cases, whom they knew and with whom they had done business for years, is completely implausible as is the claim that they had to sell the paintings because Nazi persecution left them impoverished. And this was one of the late transactions as well. So this is one of those examples where the impression is, is being given 
that Jews, of course, were perfectly free to engage in arm's length transaction if they were wealthy in the Reich. It's completely false. Also, it's saying because the person who bought it was Jewish, of course there couldn't have been um, any extortion. I have no idea whether Tannhauser was a friend or a foe of fleeing Jews. But I do know that his name has come up an awful lot in some of the ownership histories in these cases that people are claiming um, were the subject of duress. Now, these cases are being used to shut down inquiry into what the truth is. Because the, when they're kicked down on statute of limitations grounds, it's before discovery opens. So we don't have to ever get that exchange of information to try to ferret out what the truth might be. Another claim that I'll mention, another declaratory series of declaratory judgment actions were filed against um, Ms. Seeger Tom, uh, Dr. Seeger Tomschitz, who had no idea, just like Ms. Marie Altman had no idea, she had no idea she had a claim. Her fa our father had owned um, a gallery in Vienna, and he had um, paintings by, primarily by um, two different artists. And after the war, her family, um, some members had been murdered, other members sent to camps, and they were relying on memory after the war to reclaim what they could remember was in the gallery, and they knew he had um, kokushkas, um, but they didn't know he had romakos. And after Austria um, started to clean up its restitution record and started to do some independent investigation, sent her a letter, and it said, it is certain that these paintings we found in our museum involved art objects from the property of Dr. Oscar Reichel and which in connection with the power seizure by National Socialism he had to sell due to his persecution as a Jew to the galleries mentioned. Now other paintings followed the exact same path through the same dealer who was Otto Kallir who was, who was said to have the biggest influence in modern art collecting in this country. And again, I don't know whether Otto Kallir is a friend or foe of fleeing Jews. But I know that his name has come up an awful lot in some of these cases where people are claiming that people were victimized. These two other paintings went through the exact same path. Museum of Fine Arts Boston and then a collector down in Louisiana filed again declaratory judgment actions in order to block the claim. So whereas a Vienna court, uh, sorry, Vienna Museum says it is clear this belongs to you, our courts are saying you don't even have the power to come and complain about it. I'm going to skip this for now. This one disturbs me as well for the same similar reasons. Um, and this is not an instance of the museum filing declaratory judgment action, but the heirs of George Gross, um, who had fled the regime because he was an anti-totalitarian artist, fled the regime right before it came to power. And his art dealer had his paintings. And we know we have literature that backs up that the art dealer's gallery was in fact Aryanized. The court in this, this case characterized the closing of the gallery as being due to financial missteps. Um, I, I think it's due to being a Jew within the Third Reich after 1933. Um, but MoMA refused to even turn over basic research documents, provenance documents, so that the claimants could take a look at MoMA's claim that it held title to the painting and we had a voluntary sale. That's in complete contradiction to not only Museum Ethics Guidelines, the Washington Principles, and the Terezin Declaration, but MoMA's own website, which says that its files are open to all serious researchers. In this case as well, there was exchange of letters um, between MoMA and an art historian um, for the heirs before lawyers got involved, and the court said, ah, when MoMA sent this one letter, this one particular nasty letter, um, you should have been on notice that they had refused your claim at that point. So by the time they got to the court, they were a couple months too late. So here we are in 2011, and a case can be, can be barred because it's a couple of months too late? It's absurd. Here are just two of the other paintings that are at issue. I'm going to skip these, but there's potential for both of these to reach the Supreme Court on different grounds. So countries as well are being sued and fighting in court. Um, and this is another case that I don't think I will have too much time to discuss here. But I think the Supreme Court's going to take a look at this one. California passed a law that extended the statute of limitations for Holocaust um, survivors and heirs to reclaim their art um, out to 2010. So now it's passed. But, um, and the Ninth Circuit, a two-judge panel, said that um, 
that the statute was unconstitutional. So the Ninth Circuit is even blocking, if we take that logic, it's even blocking the ability of states to do anything about this to make sure that the courts are open and we don't have more bad decisions by judges in applying the discovery rule to statute of limitations principles. And I'm very hopeful that the Supreme Court is going to take a look, and I think it likely will. Um, I don't, as I said, I love museums. I don't think they are all bad. So what I'm going to do now is just click through some slides of restitutions. They looked at it. They either did the right thing. Some instances, litigation was required before we had restitution. And certainly, not all claims are right. There are mistakes. And museums have to be careful before we restitute um, property back to people who may not be the right claimants or may not have a claim at all. So I'll just click through a few slides just to show you. And if you go to the law firm of the herrick.com, herrickfeinstein.com is a law firm up in New York. There's a lot of these claims. Um, and if you go under the, um, uh, you go to, I think, services, art, law department, and then under publications, they maintain a chart of all known restitutions. It's a very useful chart. So here are just a few, right? So it's not the case that all museums are pummeling claimants into the ground, but some of our very prominent ones have. And we need the museums if we're going to actually restitute Nazi looted art from them. We need the information that they hold. Um, also, we need their leadership uh, in order to show other museums <coughs> what should be done. And when we have some museums using the judicial branch in a way that is contrary um, to the desires of the executive branch, we completely hinder the ability of, ability of the United States to lead the world anymore when it comes to restitution of Holocaust era assets. We have plenty of the art, we have plenty of paintings and other things here, um, but the rest of the world also does. And if we want to try to exert pressure on Russia, and other countries with poor restitution records were quite hypocritical when our courts are shutting down the only avenue that currently exists to recover art in this country. I want to end with one final quote. Sir Harlety Shawcross, Chief Prosecutor for the United Kingdom at Nuremberg, human memory is very short. Apologists for defeated nations are sometimes able to play upon the sympathy and magnanimity of their victors so that the true facts, never authoritatively recorded, become obscured and forgotten. Thank you. I think my fever kicked back up. <laughs> well, thank you. That was really, really fascinating. Um, all right, do you have enough energy for a couple of questions? Yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Questions? Everybody's done. There must be some questions. Do you know of any controversies presently pending with regard to the art institute of Chicago with regard to our Nazi art? Um, not. Few that were resolved. Yes, um, I don't know of any that are resolved, but oftentimes they're resolved quietly, so that that there may be, and I just wouldn't know. NAGPRA has been touted as a success, largely. Um, one of the things that NAGPRA has done is, is spurred dialogue. And um, a lot of people have pointed to even the new museum in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, Museum of the American Indian, um, as, as being sort of an outgrowth of that dialogue. So um, I, I, would, I, would, I, I don't want to compare tragedies, um, but, but I, I think that they're, they're quite different, um, but I, I, I see um, more positive, in a sense, coming out from NAGPRA when it comes to cultural property specifically. Certainly, we've had tremendous restitution of Holocaust-era assets, um, but when it comes to the art, um, it, it's, it's still lagging. Mm -hmm. Back over there. No, um, uh, I'm not Jewish. Most people, I think, assume that I am. Um, I, um, I went to grad school over in Eastern Germany because um, 
I felt like my education to then, uh, until then, had never really taught me about World War II, and I really wanted to learn. And um, I went to law school thinking that I would probably do work for refugees. Um, and uh, frankly, by the end of law school, I couldn't afford that. Um, and so I, I went to New York, and I, I worked for a, a law firm, a large law firm, and I did Holocaust um, litigation. And I also wound up, by chance, working on some art disputes that had nothing to do with the Holocaust. And when all the treaties were signed, um, I, I knew that the art, hadn't been the art issue hadn't been resolved. And I also knew I wanted to always go into academia. And so when that litigation started to stem, when the Clinton administration came to an end, I finally decided to go into academia. And so I really decided to drill down into this issue because I knew it would have to resurface. Mm -hmm. And currently reading the race of your Good, glad. I get a sense that uh, you're disturbed by the fact that the executive branch of our government and the, uh, and the judicial branch of our government don't agree on some of these issues. Ever since Marbury versus Madison, mm -hmm. that's the way it's been. <laughs> so why, I mean, why do you have this sense of, of, of their non-agreement being such an evil thing? Well, I, because I think the courts are being duped. I think that the courts um, come to these cases with relatively little historical understanding. And I think the complaints maintain, uh, the complaints that are filed by the museums, I think that they maintain um, confusion when it comes to the history. And I think if the courts were fully informed of the history, um, I think that they may come to very different conclusions in application of the discovery rule and the statute of limitations principle. I think it's. I think it will. Um, it, it has. Um, it has appeared in other Holocaust era litigation, but completely in the opposite way, in order to support dismissal, because we had all of those treaties, right, that were in place. So the United States government has appeared in many Holocaust era claims in order to encourage the court to dismiss. And I think that's what the courts remember. This is a Holocaust case. We can't handle Holocaust cases. That's political question. That's non-justiciable. That's active state. That's all of those things. And I think that's the bias that most judges bring to the case when it lands on their desk. Um, and the, the executive branch, I think, is hoping to create a commission. Um, and, and I think it will appear in at least um, uh, the Fonsaha case out of California um, and I don't know what it's going to say. But to me, judicial policy, even going back, we've had individual claims going back to the war, and executive policy have consistently, until recently, consistently said that these claims are viable. So I, I think it's a matter of um, lost history, right? forgotten history, that's infecting the way that the courts are approaching these. That is all they can do, if they truly believe that. But I don't think they're adequately informed. I think they're making fundamental mistakes in application of the discovery doctrine, which is highly fact sensitive. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know that we're dealing mostly with museums here, but, but I'm curious as to whether your research has come across any Jew-to-Jew uh, -Jew litigation in the Beit Din with regard to Jewish laws, uh, understanding of how this theft, these theft issues uh, would apply within the Jewish community. There's certain uh, rules that are found in, in, in Baba Kama with regard to abandonment mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of the hope of recovery issues, which is different than a statute of limitations. And, mm -hmm. and it affects how a person who gets mm -hmm. the property, mm -hmm. uh, whether by good or bad title, mm -hmm. might be compensated or have to deal. Mm -hmm. now, is there any Jew on Jew litigation from, from uh, <coughs> Jewish courts that you come across? I haven't seen it. I know I've seen some literature, some scholarship that talks about it, but I, I haven't seen any cases myself. There was one case, I can't remember if you put it up there, um, where the Israel Museum held mm -hmm. a piece. Yes. Um, but I they saw did the Guggenheim case also, which had a 
Yeah, but um, the Israel Museum approached it just under regular civil law. I mean, they did not turn to Jewish law to resolve it. Going back to what you were saying about the Washington Principles and the Citizen Doctrine um, Declaration, um, have the courts um, put those into consideration at all in uh, extending uh, the statute of limitations? And have those courts left the need for this permission and ownership of Ohio just discounted that? Yeah, um, in, in one of the cases, the claimants were trying to make the argument that the principles, um, the Declaration, and then Congress also had passed a statute in order to fund um, research into you know, what happened during the Holocaust with various assets. Um, and they tried to make the argument that that created a new federal cause of action you know, with an extended statute of limitations. And, and it just failed. And then the court dismissed it. And, it. and honestly, I don't believe that's a good argument. I, I don't think that's true. I, I think if we can't get the commission to work, and I'm I'm hopeful about the commission, but um, I'm also fearful in light of how some museums have acted, some very prominent museums have acted, about the ability of the commission to function in that environment. Um, if the commission doesn't work, I think we need federal legislation. Uh, you know, finally, I think that it, maybe the day has come. You know, museums have been saying since the 90s, you know, they testified in Congress about this problem. And you know, let us regulate it. We have ethics codes. We're going to do this research. And well, where is it? You know, and, and now that the time seems to be passing, and now we're swept up into all sorts of other very um, important issues, and, and this is taking a back seat.